This is Debbie, and welcome to the Offbeat Life Mentorship, where we go beyond sharing inspiring stories to helping a listener get to the next step of the life they truly want to live. A listener of the Offbeat Life podcast is given the opportunity to be on the show and interview a past guest and myself so they can pick our brains and learn our trade secrets. Welcome back to another episode of the Offbeat Mentor. This week, I invite back Erin Lowry, who is the author of Broke Millennial and a finance personal expert. Erin has successfully created a thriving career as a financial guru for millennials and has inspired our listener, Bianca Laura, to become a savvy millennial. She has observed Erin's journey and has admired her drive and honest voice on finance. I was fortunate enough to introduce these two ladies and allow them to engage in an incredible conversation in order to get Bianca to the next level to becoming a financial badass. If you want to be a part of this new segment, make sure to visit theoffbeatlife.com or email me at guest at theoffbeatlife.com for more information. Listen on to find out the incredible tips that Erin shares on this mentorship episode. Hey, everyone. I am here with Bianca and Erin. Bianca is a listener of the show and she listened to Erin's episode. So Erin is the author of Broke Millennial and she has also an amazing blog. So Erin, can you tell us a little bit about yourself for our new listeners who hasn't listened to your episode yet? Sure. So I'm Erin Lowry, the author of Broke Millennial, Stop Scraping By and Get Your Financial Life Together. And my goal is to help everyone get their financial lives together. My next book is going to be all about investing. So my goal is really to be with millennials step by step in our journey of growing financially. Some with me actually learning along the way as well. And I'm very storytelling in nature, which I'm sure we're about to find out as this interview progresses. Well, hopefully Erin delivers on this. <laughs> So Bianca, you listened to Erin's episode. What was it about her and her story that made you want to reach out and talk to her? Oh my God. I feel like the question should be, why wouldn't I? I was going through, I often listen, and then I know of Erin because I've followed some of her stuff in other um, sources. And then I heard the interview and I was like, oh my God we have to meet because I also grew up with a very like financial conscious family. Like I remember watching TV and it would be like the finance stuff for my dad. When I was young, he taught me like about stocks. And so whenever they would mention it in school, I'd be like the only little kid would be like, I know what that is. And I feel like, especially this year, now that I'm in school right now, I've been way more like, oh my God, I'm not earning any money because I'm in school. Ah, I got to figure this out. I got to figure this out so I don't mess this up. And so when I listened to the podcast, I was really excited, both because I really loved how comfortable Erin was about talking about money because it's not always that you find somebody who's young and a woman who's ready to deliver and be transparent. But I also have a serious, but not married, long distance boyfriend right now and so we've had the money talk before even knowing about Aaron and I was just like <laughs> excellent yay I'm doing the right things woo 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 and so I just wanted to gush and learn more not only about her but also how she's pulled off something that's really incredible that she's managed to do I also don't remember if we talked about this but uh, my now fiance and I were long distance for four years also the finances of being long distance can be an entirely tangent conversation as well but yeah we've been together it'll be eight years in September we're getting married next week so long distance can work guys and I think Bianca you wanted to ask questions about that right yeah with uh, relationships and finance as well I am really excited to dive deep into this and I'm excited to hear what you're going to be asking Erin. So I guess the first thing I was really curious about was how you started your following because I know that you kind of it was something like a passion project that really grew. A lot of it I think is serendipitous and you can't necessarily control it'll be time and place. So many cliches around good luck and hard work coming together is what success is and to a degree that's definitely true. For me I believe putting the words broke and millennial together was just the best decision I ever made professionally. 
And there are a lot of people who have feelings about using the word broke. They're entitled to their feelings. But I believe then and now it really was representative of representing our generation and how a lot of people were feeling. I believe it's still there five years later. It was never meant to apply to me specifically, even though certainly when I first moved here and I was making $23,000, I definitely felt broke. I also think there's a big difference between being broke and being poor and that we can get into separately. But yes, having the title Broke Millennial in general helped because people just found it interesting and also the SEO juice in Google yeah. when reporters were looking for people to talk about things just kind of worked out. And I believe I just hit Twitter at the right time. And it was also the fact that when I started, which was about five and a half years ago, it was January 2013, I was one of the only single women living in an urban environment that was talking about money. A lot of the people who had personal finance blogs or who were the experts, one were men, Two were white, which I am too. And then three were typically married and a little bit on the older side. And a lot of them lived in more affordable areas with 2.5 kids and their dog and their house and their white picket fence, which is just not the real experience for so many millennials. So when I started and I was being very open and honest about the struggles of living in a big city, not making a lot of money, not being married, having to be self-sufficient, it was a very different flavor that I was bringing. Now there are oodles of resources out there and tons of blogs so really pretty much whatever your lived experience is now there is someone out there who will you will resonate with which is why always one of my pieces of advice to people starting out is find what works for you I promise it exists whether it's podcast tv show magazines blogs something out there speaks to you so don't give up just because you had one negative experience with one person who is or was an expert. So that is my big soapbox for anyone. And in terms of building the following, I would say consistency was important. I'm not as good about that on the blog right now, but I'm very continuously in the media, which yeah. helped. Uh, and I have a second book coming out only two years after my first, and then I'm signed for a third. So I'll be dropping books probably every two years for a little bit. That helped. I have a journalism and theater background from college, which was just a perfect marriage of majors and meant that when I had the opportunity to go on TV, live or recorded, I knew how to perform, which also then meant that I got invited back and that also significantly helped build the brand. So don't let anyone tell you that your majors are worthless because I have had people say that to me in life, especially when I was in school and I would tell people that I was a journalism and theater major and they're like, ha ha, that's cute. What are you going to do with your life? And this just turned out to be the perfect marriage of those two things. So you never know how something's going to manifest later. But knowing how to present, knowing how to talk to people and knowing how to write well are three skills that are never bad to know how to do. Especially in this day and age, I feel like that's yeah. such a huge thing for you. That's a really great skill to have because everyone at some point in their life is going to have social media or a website or a blog or whatever it is. And now podcasts are so big. Erin is a really great speaker. So when I edit her, for example, it's so easy. Thank you for that, Erin. You're welcome. <laughs> and being able to speak in sound bites is a very helpful skill. If you ever want to be in the media, knowing how to do that and going through some version of media training and taking improv is actually incredibly helpful for people who want to eventually be in the media because you have to learn how to be a very active listener for one. And then the other side of it too is being able to think on your feet very quickly because there are times when you get asked things on live television and you might not necessarily know the answer or feel comfortable answering that question. You have to be able to kind of do a politician pivot it to answer the question that you want to answer that wasn't actually Yeah, asked. that's really helpful to have, especially with you. You do a lot of speaking engagements. Yes. Yeah, and people will ask you uncomfortable questions, but that's going to happen. And my other big piece of advice when you're building a following, if that's something that you want to do, know what information you're willing to share about yourself. So there's an interesting version of transparency where you're right, I'm very transparent on a lot of forms of my life, but even now, my fiance, almost husband, I refer to as Peach. I don't actually talk about his real name because that's just something that that I want to keep private. It's really easy to figure out who he is if you want to, but it's just an extra layer. There are certain pieces of our lives that I'm not going to share because it's no one else's business. And you have to just be really careful about what you let out because to use a cliche, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. And that's something that's always important to know whether you're building a brand or not about social media is once it's out, it's out. So just be really careful about how you let information out. And if you're going to engage with trolls, be very tactful about that too. 
that's another easy way to burn in flames very quickly is to engage the wrong way with somebody who's gunning for you. And learning how to tactfully diffuse situations are, is a really helpful skill. And that's what they want anyway. They want a reaction from you as well. 100%. Mm -hmm. You know, this all makes a lot of sense. And it's just something that I even, as I've gone through things that are not even media related, I continually am like, oh man, I would love to know how to give you the right response without saying something a little too risque. And some of the time it's acknowledging that you don't know the answer or that the person is right. So a really exaggerated experience that I had one time is I was speaking on a panel that was about women in finance. And there was one woman of color on the panel, but she was definitely white passing. And when we got to the Q&A section, a woman raised her hand. She's an African-American woman. She goes, there's no one up there that looks like me. So I don't really relate. And I said, you know what? You're right. And we were at a conference that happens every year. And I said, two years ago, this panel never would have happened. But a bunch of women spoke up about not feeling heard. So you need to speak up about the fact that you still feel that there's an underrepresentation happening here. And then it's going to change. And me not trying to backpedal or downplay or say like, no, no, like we can all relate. No, you're right. You deserve to be heard. So I think it's also having moments like that where you acknowledge that it's acknowledging that you don't either always have the answer or also understanding that I don't know everybody's lived experience. I understand where I might have shortcomings and I have to turn to other people to help in those moments as well. And then that will allow you to be more relatable for people, even though you don't have the same background, because at least you're acknowledging issues that would backpedal on or they would just glaze over it. Yeah, and it's not trying to pretend that you know everything for everybody because another semi-similar experience, I was on a panel where I was the only white woman. It was for minorities in media, but I was just there as a woman in media. Well, the moderator asked the question, she said, for women of color, and I was the only non-woman of color on the panel, and so I made a joke about it. I'm like, I can't speak to this question. And then everybody just kind of laughed. I'm like, I can give you my experience as a woman, but I'm not going to pretend to understand every facet of this experience because we have different experience. So yes, acknowledging your shortcomings is very helpful. And it adds vulnerability and the fact that you're not trying to please everyone. Also brings me to the point of knowing your niche. And there are ways to diversify and broaden and change your niche as you grow and evolve. You know, when I started, I certainly wasn't speaking to married people where soon I will be a married woman. So it's going to change a little bit of how I talk and relate. And somebody who is 21 and single might not necessarily like what I'm doing in the same way, but that not, might not necessarily be my target audience for what I'm currently putting out. You know, I could refer that person to stuff that I used to put out. You have to know that you can't please absolutely everyone. And if you're trying to, you're going to fail because if you try to be too broad and you don't have an opinion and you're always backpedaling or you're always just kind of being broad strokes, it's not gonna appeal to everybody. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. And I guess, as you mentioned, changing and evolving, Where, what are people that you look forward or look up to as you're trying to figure things out? A really good one is Farnoosh Tarabi. Okay. As someone who's specifically in the women and in personal finance space. You know, she started when she was around my age when I started, so early 20s. She was on the journalist path, and then, you know, she ended up getting married. She now has two kids. So she's about, I would say, like six years ahead of me in life. But what she has managed to do in the various facets that she's managed to evolve into, she has her own podcast. Now she's had a TV show on CNBC. She's had a TV show on Yahoo Finance. She has huge names that come on her podcast because of who she is and how good of an interviewer she is. And she's managed to branch out into all these different ways. So I look up to her and I know her personally. She's a woman who helps other women. She's always looking and thinking about how to elevate people. And I've had media opportunities handed to me because she was busy and she referred them to me. That's another thing is learning how to give back and mentor people. And I just have so much respect for her and what she's managed to do. And I don't know her personal life, but it seems to be that she does a great job of being a strong businesswoman, but also being a wife and a mother and balancing it in and understanding that there needs time and space for all of it. Well, Bianca, you're young. Bianca is in her early 20s. So you may not be thinking about this right now, but you soon will be. Maybe you are. I don't know. It's, it's really hard, especially if you're trying to succeed as a woman and we all know it's really hard to do that in starting a family and even just in a relationship because a lot of times when you're going after something that you really want, your time is not 
as much anymore and you don't have all of that time to devote to your significant other anymore or even family, it really takes a lot of prioritizing and making sure that it happens in order for you to really succeed in that. It is hard. I think it's also important to realize, especially in a relationship, it's never a 50-50 split in the moment. And I believe that oftentimes we want it to be just an always equitable division of labor. And there are going to be times when your life is more stressful and therefore your partner might need to pick up some slack and then it might pivot where your partner's having a more stressful time and you have to pick up some slack. And if we always focus on constant 50-50 division, it really sets us up for failure. Where to use a real life example, when I'm in the throes of either writing a book or promoting a book, I'm working 14 hour days a lot of the time because I'm still needing to do other things and I'm not cleaning, I'm not cooking, I'm not doing other things that you need to do to survive. I'm not talking gender roles, I'm just saying you don't want to live in a pigsty and you need to feed yourself. So my partner does a very good job of handling almost all of our day-to-day life things in those moments. But then it flips. There are times where he has more going on and I need to assume more of that role. And as life evolves and changes, you just need to be open to feeling out those shifts and recognizing that they kind of need to happen. And there's definitely something, I think there's been a bit more conversation around the idea of partner privilege in general that I feel is very interesting and acknowledging that when you're in long distance, you don't have it in the same way. You have an emotional support system that might be there. And I definitely had that when we were long distance. But there's something about physically having someone there when you're having a bad day and you need to vent or you just can't take the time to handle something and they can handle it for you. There is an inherent privilege to that happening, married or not. That isn't to say one is better or one's worse, but I think it is important to acknowledge that a lot of the success that I've had is also because there's a support system at home that helps propel me to be able to do it. And of course you can do it if you're single. Of course you can do it if you're by yourself. But yeah, it is a little bit harder. Much more helpful when you have another person, like you said, to take the slack when you can't do it. Because honestly, for me as well, there's days where I don't get out of my PJs and just work straight through from the moment I wake up until I sleep with drool on my face. It's good to have a partner that can do that. And Bianca, you said you were in a long distance relationship. You're not in one right now, right? Yes, I am. Yeah, so we met almost three years ago now. Don't want to get that wrong. (laughs) Um, And so we met while I was still in college. We dated for about two years. And so we had a chance to like dip our toe into long distance while in school, but never had to fully commit because he's in Maryland and I'm in New York. But after I graduated, I came over. And so since then, we've been doing long distance, which has been, I think, really great for our relationship and for communication. But definitely there came a point where it was like, okay, we are long distance. We care about each other. This might have some legs. If this is going to go somewhere, we need to talk numbers because without those numbers, we're not going to go anywhere. And so we now, thankfully, he satisfied my neurosis and we now share an Excel sheet, a Google sheet with our budget. Love it. And we talk about our goals every three months. And we check in on each other and it's not like we're nitpicking about who's spending what, but it's nice to be like, oh, you are saving. We might actually live together someday. Yay. And an accountability buddy is huge. And if you don't have a partner, just having a friend who you can do that kind of stuff with, just like if you're trying to lose weight, because there's always the correlations between finance and fitness, it's very much the same thing. And I will say 100% about communication, long distance it either breaks you or it makes you the world's best communicators because that's one thing that we definitely have going for us in our relationship is from so many years of long distance, we know how to talk to each other and how to communicate. And it's also an evolving process. Things change. Once you start living around each other again, you got to make sure you still like each other in the <laughs> same way. I also do not recommend going straight from long distance to living each o- with each other. You'll kill each other. Like give yourselves maybe like a six month buffer where you don't live together. Yes, reacclimate to each other first. It's it's just a healthy, important transition because if you go, moving in with somebody is a lot. I think that's why they used to say the first year of marriage was the hardest was because historically people did not live together ahead of time. No one likes when I say this, but I think that if we had moved straight in, if we had just gotten married and yeah. moved in together, 
I don't know if we'd still be together. I feel like we could have gotten divorced as opposed to going the route we did because it always felt like a conscious decision to be staying together even in the tough times where if we had gotten married very quickly, I think I would have felt forced and pressured. Yeah. And I just know my, my emotional responses to stuff like that. I would have been like, nope. But yeah, having a little bit of time to reacclimate post long distance before moving in. Erin and even Bianca, I'm sure you guys have met a lot of women. I thought it was just me. I feel like there's a lot of pressure in marriage and there's a lot of things happening where whether it's from you yourself, whether you're seeing it in the media or your family or friends, everybody's getting married, especially Erin in our age. There's so much pressure. Like it's different for everybody, you know, and you have to do it when you want to do it and not necessarily when everybody tells you because that's why divorce rates are so high is because you feel like you have to do it. And we're scared, mm -hmm. especially if you're in your 30s or late 20s, if you've been with somebody for some time. It's really good to be able to know the person first before you actually marry them. Because there's a lot of things that happens throughout your relationship that may come out years later that you don't know. You know, <laughs> maybe you're just getting comfortable in that stage and you never know. Yeah. And there are so many gendered assumptions around marriage and who's pushing for it and who wants it when. I mean, for me, that was something that was incredibly frustrating. We had been together about six years. Well, we had been together about five years when I got the book deal. It came out in around year six. And when I got the book deal, I remember saying, please do not propose because I don't want to have to deal with trying to plan a wedding and doing this. I said, I really want to focus on my career and my profession. This just isn't a good time in my life. But I would get so many comments from people when they would hear how long we had been together that were like, oh, is he just not putting a ring on it? Which, by the way, I don't even wear an engagement ring. Didn't want one. Didn't ask for asked specifically not to have one. I can expect that from yeah. you. <laughs> yep. That's a whole other conversation we can have later. <laughs> but you get a lot of that kind of conversation. And then as soon as we did get engaged... I was asked within two weeks when I thought we would be having kids and if I plan to raise kids in New York City. I was like, well, first of all, it's not your business. Second of all, we're not there yet. And what is wrong with raising kids? Yeah, they turn out great. I mean, look at us. I was also raised in major metropolitan areas and I'm a fine human. <laughs> so it's just people feel entitled and people are always going to have opinions about your life. And it's the same as building a brand. You are always going to have people who disagree with you, who come at you. You just got to learn how to let it go or have conversations with people that are worth having the conversations with. But a lot of times have whatever canned response you want to have. When people ask me about kids, sometimes I just like to shock value and say either we're not having them, which depending on closeness of the person asking is like a slightly traumatizing experience to people. The other thing is don't ask folks because maybe they're trying and they're having a hard time and it's really not your damn business. So that's my PSA about babies do not ask people if they're trying to have babies because maybe they are and it's not going well well I feel the same way about at least especially right now where I'm at there's a lot of people who ask so what's your job what are you working so what are you doing actually what I mean low-key is what's your job how much are you making and it's it's very it's filled with a lot of assumptions and it puts a lot of value into something that ultimately if you ain't gonna Put in your two cents and help money-wise. Why do you care? That never goes away, especially if you're in. I think it's a little bit more loaded with heterosexual relationships and same-sex relationships, but it still can play either way. But if you're married to a man and you say you're a freelancer, the immediate assumption is that you're a kept woman. Yeah. Nine times out of ten. And also being a breadwinning woman tends to add more anxiety to a relationship. And... If you haven't watched Ali Wong, either of Ali Wong specials, you need to. But in her recent one, she talks about it a little bit. And there have been, sadly, a lot of studies that have come out saying that breadwinning women either downplay their success in public to bolster the man's ego or that they end up getting divorced. If you have the level of communication about money that you have right now early on, it bodes very, very well. And I have no idea how things will play out long term, but I also have a sense that if you come into the relationship with a power dynamic of the woman is currently making more and it stays that way, I think that it tends to be a little bit easier for people because you entered the marriage that way or the relationship, where if that flips later and it's a power dynamic shift, I think either way, regardless of gender, if you have a power dynamic shift, it can 
bring in some tremors into a relationship. So you need to have that communication and that openness with each other and talk about how you're feeling. If you're feeling some type of way about it, you need to have a healthy conversation about it. What's been your litmus test when you're talking to some of your friends about who you can trust to have certain conversations with and who you really can't share certain information with? You know which of your friends have big mouths. It doesn't (laughs) need to be a money thing. You know that. And your aunts and your uncles and your cousins, like you know who in the family has a big mouth. That's just something I think we know in relationship dynamics. What you see is that when you first get out of college, if everyone's kind of making about the same amount of money, there doesn't tend to be a lot of tension. The tension comes in as life changes and decisions get made that impact how much you're making. And it's, you know, your one friend got married and had kids at a very early age compared to everyone else. So their financial situation, regardless of how much they're making, is just different. And then you got the one friend who's got six-figure student loan debt. So even if they've got a good salary, it's a different situation. And your one friend who's just like invented an app and sold it to Google and is making mad money. And that's a different situation. So the way you start to handle and have to communicate about money is going to be an ever evolving thing. I've also noticed that as friends couple up, it changes your conversation because maybe they feel it's not their business to share their partner's information or their partner has asked that that information not get shared. And so maybe the openness starts to close up a little bit, which you have to respect what people's relationship dynamics are and how open they want to be. So I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that necessarily, as long as it's not a financially abusive scenario. And you just always, I feel the friend and relationship dynamic, just like with family, it's an ever evolving conversation. Year to year, it is probably going to change, especially as you're building careers and things can shift so quickly. I entered the workforce before most of my friends because most of my friends went to graduate school. So I was in such a different place, even three, four years out than they were when they started actually working. And not even just financially, but also in what I had learned and what I had been exposed to and the fact that I hadn't been living in a bubble for a period of time. And that really shifted how I interacted. And your value sets are going to change. You know, maybe you all value getting together once a year and traveling, But as people's lives and dynamics change, stuff starts to fall away a little bit or you have to be putting in more of the effort. And that can be rife with resentment as well. It just totally, it's part of the adulting, quote unquote, experience of your 20s into your early 30s. It's also really sad because sometimes you know people for a really long time and their relationship shifts and it's not the same anymore, the closest you had. And you don't have to give up on a relationship because things are shifting and you know for me a really good example is my best friend got married and had a baby way before me because I'm not even married yet and don't plan to have kids for a little while and at first I I felt a lot of feelings about it because I was very worried that this is going to be such a dividing topic because her life is going to change so drastically as it should. Like I acknowledge that that needs to be a life altering experience, but here I am like partying in New York city and here you are needing to be a mom. And are we going to have the same common ground? And for about six to eight months after the baby was born, it was a little touch and go because a lot of life was about the baby And it got to a point for me where I'm like, I'm happy to hear some updates, but I'm really not that interested because I don't have one and I don't have, we don't have the same shared experience. These days, I love getting the updates and he's also my godson and he's also the cutest freaking kid, but that's not what we talk about all the time anymore. It did turn back around to let's, we are two intelligent women. Let's have conversations about life. And so this is all to say There can be kind of moments where you feel a little touch and go about things, but don't necessarily give up on a relationship just because dynamics are shifting. You just learn how to have to, you have to alter the blueprint. And it's the other part of that was I was used to talking to her every day. So I got a little resentful when she was understandably freaking busy and I didn't get to hear from her every day. Did you get jealous of the baby? Oh, I did. It's like (laughs) how you hear like dads get jealous of babies when their wives have them or whatever. Siblings. It's a very similar feeling. If you're used to having a certain type of relationship and that gets disrupted. So, and then I also was realizing how selfish and childish I was being by feeling this way. And as soon as you start to acknowledge and that stuff starts to go away, like, okay, so maybe we don't text every day, but maybe we still talk or text two or three times a week. Or, you know, when the baby was first on the scene, 
yeah, maybe it was once a week at most, slash all the pictures on Facebook. But then all that started to ease up. I started to hear from her more. I wasn't getting 20 photos a day. She will even acknowledge these days. She's like, yeah, it was excessive. <laughs> so I just feel that as people's lives evolve and as your life evolves, and maybe you go through the experience first and you're the one that's having a big life change when your friends aren't. And you need to be empathetic to them. They need to be empathetic to you. Everybody can get a little mad for a little while, but you can come back to each other as well. How did you handle your personal financial anxieties? Because I, I know at least for me, it's really easy to get in my head and very quickly spiral from very okay to we'll be sleeping outside tomorrow. <laughs> Especially when you freelance, financial anxiety is always <laughs> low-key there. <laughs> no matter how well you're doing. And... I would say having buffers, you know, having your emergency fund fully funded and having those kind of buffers can help mentally bring you back from the ledge when you're having your feels. But if you're prone to financial anxiety, I don't think it ever totally goes away. You just learn how to manage it in different forms. Having a partner who doesn't exactly feel the same way you do, whether that's romantic or business, it doesn't necessarily have to be a romantic partner. It could be a business partner. It could just be a confidant with whom you talk about money. Having someone who has a different mindset can also be very helpful because it can balance you out. There's also such a thing as a financial therapist if things get real bad. And also hiring a certified financial planner if and when you get to that phase of life. So having somebody else who's there to kind of audit your decisions, checking in, making sure you're still going to reach your goals, who doesn't have the same emotional reaction that you do right. is very helpful. When it comes to investing, if you are very risk adverse, I would say don't check your portfolio constantly. A friend of mine had her investments at the same bank as she did her regular checking. So every time she logged on to regular checking, she could see her investments. I was like, mm, this has to change because you're going to drive yourself batch every single time you log in. If the market's taken a small tumble that day, but all you see is red when you log in and you know you're a risk averse person, this isn't healthy for you. So you will start to identify your triggers. And then you can start to figure out how to set up little baby gates to protect yourself from yourself. And some of that can be, you know, I actually have half of my savings at a completely separate bank than where I do my checking. So when I log into my checking accounts, I'm not seeing all the glorious savings accounts. And therefore, I am not tempted to skim a little off the top for something today. So that's just one like really simple checks and balances that works for me. Yeah. Have you ever thought about becoming a financial planner? I have. So I've gone through th half of the classes it requires to become a CFP. I'm very torn about whether or not it's actually ever going to be something I go all, I think I will finish all the classes and take the test just to do it and have the feather in the cap. I don't know that I'll ever be practicing because there's a lot of compliance behind it. So then I'm a little worried that it'll handcuff this and the ability to do the more the, the kind of speaking that I do, the kind of books that I write, because if I had to run it through compliance every single time, which someone who freelances with financial institutions, it's an MF nightmare. I'm debating about whether or not it's the right move. And I've spoken to a lot of people who are smarter than I am, who have picked different versions of this path, and it really hasn't clarified anything because it's a little different for everybody. So I have to figure out what I want next steps before I decide if I'm going to go that route. How have you balanced the creative, entrepreneurial, broke millennial side of everything and the nitty gritty taxes, healthcare? Small panic attacks from time to time. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not, it's hard. And that's why I recommend anyone that follows an entrepreneur on social media and your social media accounts look beautiful <laughs> all the time. And it's hard because it's so easy to put out that version of yourself. Mm -hmm. I try to level in, especially my Instagram stories is where I'm the most honest because if I'm just feeling some type of way in a moment, I like to share it and Twitter. I think it's important as someone who's doing what I do to demonstrate that it's not always roses. It can be really, really hard and that a lot of what you're seeing on social media is fake or a very surface level look at what is going on in someone's life. And there are all those articles about the Instagram influencers who are broke and all sorts of things. There's a lot of them. Yeah. I know some. Yeah. <laughs> it's, oh, no. it's bad. I mean, you can spend so much money trying to make that happen for yourself. If you want to grow your following, Bianca, I would go towards Erin's route rather than high following but no money route honestly right now you can pay for all of this stuff you can actually pay people to be your followers 
And it's not very hard. I mean, it takes a long time if you want to do it legitimately. But what Erin is doing is she has a business from it. She has books that she's writing. She has a blog that she came from. And then now she has a book from it. She does speaking engagements. And there's a lot of influencers where it's just free stuff. Or they get very minimal amount of money. And the following doesn't really count unless you're a very good and savvy businesswoman. It's so much better if you know how to be a good business person than just have the following because you don't need to have a lot of following to actually make money if you know how to negotiate if you know how to do sales if you know how to create packages that will make you a lot more money I think that's that's not said enough I think it's just a following right. that people look at but it's not looked at as a business yeah because it's also how are they engaged because there are those people who go out to click farms and buy the followers but then you can so easily tell because especially on things like twitter and instagram if and i think twitter especially if you scroll through on their tweets and they've got thirty thousand followers but only one or two likes per tweet something doesn't smell right where if you've got people who are getting, you know, 10 to 50 likes per tweet and that makes that correlates with how many followers they have or like people actually interact when they ask a question, you want the more engaged people. And the other thing is, how do you want to monetize? Because I've been very, very careful about this where I don't have ads all over my site. I partner with brands every once in a while, but I do it sparingly enough that my followers aren't feeling overwhelmed. I try to put a lot of free content out there so that when I do write a book, people want to buy it because they feel like I've put other value out there for them. I also just genuinely want to help people, which not everyone, a lot of people start blogging because they think it's an easy way to make money. It's not. And whatever version of a brand you're trying to build, it should be something in which you are actually passionate and interested. Because if you just go into a silo that you think is going to make you money, you're going to burn out real quick. And in terms of balancing in insurance and all that kind of other stuff, living in New York City has been a bit advantageous and being under 30 because I personally have used Oscar, like the catastrophic version, which is I think 174 something a month. I don't have any chronic ailments. Again, part of this is certain privilege checks that allow me to do what I do. So I have no chronic ailments. I'm not on any regular medication. So I can be on the cheapest version of healthcare, which basically is if I get hit by a cab tomorrow, at least I'm not going to get bankrupted by the medical bills. That's one thing. Having to be your own CEO and tech support and payroll and HR is very overwhelming some days. And that's part of what needs to be spoken about more. It is not for the faint of heart. There are going to be days that you just want to break every dish in your kitchen because a client is driving you nuts. There are going to be times you have to take gigs where they should always align with your ethics and ethos. But you might have to work with a client that is just straight up difficult because the price tag is too good to pass up as long as it's not, you know, for me, I would never, ever, ever work with a payday lender. It doesn't matter how much they offer me. They would have to straight up buy out for multiple millions of dollars the Broke Millennial brand. I just wouldn't even, I think that it's just not ethical for me. It rails against everything I have talked about. So if all of a sudden I'm like, oh, by the way, here's like a paid ad for this payday lender, even though there's this whole history of me, you know, trolling that comp or that kind of environment doesn't line up. So have your ethics, know what you stand for, be aware that there are going to be really shitty days. Your mental health is going to take a beating on some of those days. So you need to have some sort of support system in place. Maybe it is having a therapist. Maybe it's having a personal trainer. Having a dog is very, very helpful <laughs> for your mental health when you're self-employed and work at home. And having mastermind groups. So groups of people, they don't necessarily have to be your specific niche, but who do something similar to what you do so you can all, you know, share tactics on how you handle things or just be a general support system when you need to vent. I have ones where we do Skype, you know, every other week or maybe once a month for different niches. So it's like more influencer type stuff one is just for authors a lot of them also have facebook groups so if there's a question you need a quick crowdsource for you can jump in and ask the question and people can help so masterminds are incredibly effective and helpful and you can set up your own you know if there's just people that you know online they don't even have to be people we've met in real life and you can reach out and say hey we do kind of similar things i want to form a mastermind group and get together and talk meeting in real life is very helpful what did you think you were going to be, Erin? An actress, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was going to make it. 
<laughs> and then I chickened out and didn't even really try. Fun fact. And There's still time. Oh, I, I actually <laughs> now my kind of long term dream is to just be the grandma on every sitcom. Like when we get to that phase, I want to be 65 to 85 and just that's when I'm going to start. You, you should do like a Golden Girls type Or show. I'm just like a C-list actress who everyone's like, that's the woman who's always the grandma and everything. And I'll be like, that's me. And like they don't know exactly your name, but they know you from somewhere. Yeah. I want everybody to stop me on the street and be like, you look familiar. <laughs> I wish I had known and I'm still working very hard on how to build a team. I'm not good at delegating. And that is such a critical skill set. So I really wish I had been better sooner about figuring out how to do that. And it's something I'm currently still struggling with and working on. And I do try to kind of share a bit of that journey on social media. I actually went to a retreat back in May of this year with a bunch of women for a women in business thing. And we did this hot seat where you said what you kind of felt that your pain points were and what you wanted solved. And then you had to be quiet for 30 minutes while they talked about you in front of you. Very interesting experience. And one of the big takeaways for me is a lot of people are like, how are you doing what you're doing without any sort of support staff? And I'm like, one, I don't sleep a lot. Two, my partner is my day, like life support staff. So he takes care of so much of life that it allows me to have the time to focus on my business. Without him, I really don't think I would have been able to do any of this. And I didn't realize it until that moment that that's really how things have been balanced out. But I did slowly start to cede control. I do now have an assistant who takes care of things that, like, do I need to be building the newsletter? Like, isn't that something that she can brainstorm and I can outsource? Some people will outsource their social media. That's one that I still maintain very tight fist over because I like it to be me. I like having the genuine connections with people. You just figure out what it is about your brand and your company and your life that you don't actually have to be the one controlling all the time. So I launched this series called Broke Millennial No More on the blog. So every Friday it's a new story from someone. I source a lot of them because I share on Twitter like, hey, submit your stories. But she edits them, does the back and forth, requests permissions from people, make sure that we get a photo of them, all that stuff. And then even down to uploading it, she handles I just take a final edit and tweak it and make sure it's in a good place. So proud that of has you saved. for doing this. Thank you. I'm very <laughs> proud of myself for that one. That saves a lot of time. Learning how to have a team. Also, finding an agent if you want to be in more of the speaker realm. I go back and forth about having one because I love negotiating. So sometimes I just kind of want to do it because it's fun. Or it might be a client I've worked with in the past. So I feel like it would be weird to say, no, here's my agent now, which is probably not that weird. But I feel if we have some sort of rapport, I still want to be the touch person. But I have a client right now that it has been an utter nightmare to work with. And so I've had to turn into the pit bull where I'm having to be the bad guy all the time because they're screwing things up and I'm not been paid yet. And you as the talent don't want to have to be the bad guy. That's something you want to outsource to somebody else to lay down the hammer. Thinking about it more critically like that, where it's like, sure, maybe you're great at negotiating, but 15% to an agent who can be the bad guy and hunt down payments and take that off your mental to-do list is actually probably pretty worth also it. Also your mental health. Oh, because let me tell you, I like, had a 20 minute cry before I came down to this because of some bull that I've been dealing with. And my fiance actually like was very sweet. He goes, do you, do you need me to walk with you so you can just vent on the way down there? So yes, having a person romantic or otherwise, or just mm -hmm. being able to call your mom or your sister. Cause my sister does a very similar job, different, but entrepreneurial. So yes, we often will just call and vent to each other because we can. So you have to have your people and also just acknowledge there are times where it's going to be really awful and hard and you're going to want to maybe quit that's okay too and give yourself time off I know I'm like super on a roll right now and I need to <laughs> let you talk again but give yourself breaks give yourself time off you see people that are out there that have the mantra of like always be hustling hustle 24 7 oh for the love of god take a break because if you don't, you're going to burn out and you're going to burn out so fast. And whether that's every couple of months, you take a week long trip and you unplug, you have an out of office thing on, you are not getting on social media. You just tell your followers like disconnecting. 
you talked about Peach being your support system. Has there been any issues with him taking all of this in? Because I know right now with my partner, we've been together for a really long time and we had a really deep discussion about this and I didn't realize I was giving him so much work and he was such a really good support system. But it came to the point where we were neglecting him and his needs. We've never gone through more than maybe three or four weeks at a time where he's taking on more of a burden. And then, well, one, I always acknowledge and thank in the moments. So it's, I will say, you know, I appreciate you. I see you. Thank you so much for doing this, which helps because I feel like things pivot back moderately quickly. But I could see moving forward, especially if we ever introduce kids into our lives, that that could be a, a tipping point where things happen. And I also feel like that's a time where maybe you seek outside help and you go to a counselor or a therapist as a couple to just figure out how to have coping strategies that are gonna work, making sure you're hearing each other, all that kind of stuff. So I also try to mix up who I'm complaining to. To be honest, <laughs> I do kind of think through that. I don't try to diversify it, even with my business friends. I don't wanna always be going to the one person because you don't, also, you don't want to be seen as a constant complainer yeah. to your one friend. And different people have different experiences, so you start to know who you can go to about different things. And sometimes they've worked with the same client, so you can be like, oh, my God, so and so is just the worst. <laughs> <laughs> and it just feels good. Oh, man, that was a great question, Deb, because I know that's a conversation I've actually had with my partner where it's just like, especially in a long distance relationship where there's so much talking and there's not as many opportunities to check in and really reassert, like, thank you. I see you. We've had times where it's just like, you've really been complaining for like a couple of weeks now about the same thing. And I'll be like, oh, I didn't notice. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'll take care of this. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it also comes down to personality types. If you and your partner have similar dispositions, then it might even cause a little bit more stress earlier. Peach and I are very different people. Which is also a little problematic sometimes on my end because he's a bit more anxious than I am. So sometimes I have a very like, buck it up, deal with it. And my sister, who has a more anxious disposition, is actually the one that schooled me and said like, no, that's not how you deal with anxiety. You have to hear it and acknowledge it and have a conversation about it. So that was very helpful for us. There are also moments, though, where you can be like, I'm, I've had enough of the complaining. My baseline is not to be complaining about my job. So I think it's just when he sees that I'm having a particularly stressful go of it, he knows I just need to get it out. Yeah. And I'm also a person that I emote fast and furiously and then I'm done. It's not an extended thing. So if I've gotten into a bad place for some reason, there's usually really good reason for me to be in it. I like how this didn't go hard finance. This went very, like, entrepreneurial, I career know. focused, I didn't which even, is nice. Yeah, I'm glad where this all went. Wasn't sure where it'd go, but. I will give my one thought on long-distance relationships for anybody listening who's not as transparent as you are with your partner about money. For us, one of the things that was really helpful, uh, we were making different incomes. He was still in school, and I was actually working, so I had more money. Then he started working but was still in school. And one of the ways that we kind of handled the finances of that is instead of, you know, every time I went to visit him, I just paid for it, my ticket because it got to be disproportionate. There would be times where like three or four times in a row I was going to him. We always split travel 50-50 when somebody traveled. That's what we do. Yeah, oh, it makes man. it so much easier. It takes all the such, stress out. Oh, man. I feel like I'm doing all the right things. Yeah. Bianca is dancing you are, right now. You are vindicated <laughs> in whatever you are doing with that. It does take so much of the stress out because then it never becomes a pissing contest of, I've come to you three times and you haven't come to me. Just split it down the middle on the cost of travel as long as it's obviously like they're not traveling first class, whatever, to come see you. My One of my broke millennial no more moments was when I could finally upgrade from the Greyhound to Amtrak to go visit him. Fancy. I'm oh, it felt so good. <laughs> Not Ooh. there. Goals. Goals. You'll get there. You'll get there. Because when that moment happens, you're like, I have made it. <laughs> and then eventually if you go from Amtrak to flying, you're like, oh, my God. This is so unbelievable. The yeah, Greyhound to Amtrak, world of difference. Especially super early in the morning or super late at night, especially at a port authority. <laughs> For all the New Yorkers listening. So, Bianca, after talking to Erin and meeting her in person, what was the best thing that you took out from this conversation? Oh, man, there's so many things. I'm going to focus in on one. Because if I say all of them, we're going to be here for a while. I really, I think especially 
when we first started hearing you talk about being thoughtful about how you speak and how you have presence, because ultimately what you say, how you're putting yourself out there in person and in writing really makes a difference, really stood out to me and is something that I think I'm going to be really thoughtful for moving forward on how to refine and like perfect. And just being who you are most of the time comes across. So writing how you talk or, and then that, it just trickles into everything else. Cause I always love when I meet people who don't know me and they're like, Oh, you sound in real life. Like you do in your book or you sound on Twitter. Like you do in person. It's always a nice cohesion. And then there's never doubt that someone else is behind pulling the strings. They feel like is, they know you. That's a cute thing. If you get to a, a point where you're you know, like meeting people who follow you, I always find it adorable when folks know things about my life because I've put it out there publicly, which it's not creepy. Like if I've put out, you know, that I'm getting married soon or that I have a dog named Mosby, like it doesn't bother me if you know this information. But sometimes I have people like, I feel like I'm being like stalkerish saying, asking questions about Mosby or about Peach. I'm like, it's all right. If I put it out there, you're fine. Don't worry about it. I understand why someone might feel weird about it. I'm like, if I put it out there, it's it's worth knowing. Now, if you know things that I haven't publicly put out there that you're bringing up, then we have a problem. That's different. <laughs> that's when you need a restraining order. Yeah. That's... <laughs> so, Bianca, if our listeners want to follow your journey, where can they find you? I just changed my Instagram name yesterday, and so I don't remember my handle. This is bad branding. I'm just going to say that right well, now. I, it's really funny because I changed my name because I knew I really wasn't a fan of it. A friend of mine had made it for me, and I was just like, I don't really like it. It's not reflective of me, and it's not easy to say. But for um, branding purposes, too, before you pick a name, make sure that no one else has it. Go see if you can buy the domain name and try to buy, like, not buy, but try to get all the social handles and then buy the domain name before you actually launch something. Because I didn't get to Broke Millennial on Instagram when I should have, so I have to be Broke Millennial blog because someone has an inactive Broke Millennial account. Did you message them? Yeah, message they them? never responded and Instagram still lets it live even though they haven't posted in years. So that's the other thing is trademark your brand early because I can't tell you the number of Adventures of a Broke Millennial, One Broke Millennial, The Broke Millennial that I have had to send very friendly cease and desist letters to. So don't waste your time and money if you haven't, you know, do the research first. Make sure that there's not an established brand using that already. All right, friends. The moment we've all been waiting for has come. So my Instagram handle is Bianca B Me. That is me, Bianca, B-I-A-N-C-A, B. B-E, just so you know, me. That is me, so you can find me. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a jingle in there somewhere. Yeah, we tried. I really, <laughs> the amount of thought into this, you don't want to know. Well, thank God nobody took that name already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm kind of surprised. Yeah, that's, that's a clever true. one. A also, own your name as a domain. Like, whether or not you're going to use it, it's just good to own it. So, advice to anyone listening right now, whatever your name is, .com, see if it's still available and go buy it. Because particularly for those in college. That might need to be a resume website at some point. And sidebar about babies, it's a great baby gift for people is to buy the domain name of their child's name. <laughs> That's really funny. I'll keep that one I in love mind. That. That's also really good life advice, like own your name. <laughs> own <Yeah>. it. <laughs> and do you have anything exciting that you're working on today, Bianca, that you want to share? Um, not today. I'm finishing my master's in social work in a year. So in a year, if you want to hire me, holla. <laughs> <laughs> And then we'll catch up with you after you graduate or even sooner than that and see what you're up to. Yeah. So that's going to be exciting. So what about you, Erin? Do you have anything exciting that we can look forward to? The book number two. Yes. Coming out <laughs> April. We don't have a set de date yet, but April 2019. Broke Millennial Takes on Investing, A Beginner's Guide to Leveling Up Your Money, which is a true rookie's guide of how to start investing. Very millennial focused, so things like if you have student loan debt, should you be investing? There's an app for that. Should you be using them? Stuff like that. And I've got a few other things in the pipeline that I can't quite talk about quite yet. But if you follow me on Twitter at Broke Millennial or Instagram, Broke Millennial blog, I will be releasing more details there soon. Nice. We can't wait for that. We're going to be looking out for all of the secret my announcements. Announcements that you're going to have soon. Yes, the announcement that I can't even do yet should actually 
be available for people by December, January. So even before the book, but that's so not exciting. quite there yet. And then of course you're getting married soon. Oh yeah. So that's happening too. <laughs> She's like, oh yeah, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the real life thing. So Erin, if our listeners want to find you, where can they go? Well, my website is brokemillennial.com. Even if you misspell millennial in Google, you will still get there. <laughs> And then Twitter is at Broke Millennial. Instagram is at Broke Millennial blog. Facebook is also Broke Millennial, but I'm going to be real straight with you. I'm not super active on Facebook anymore. So Twitter is my main venue. Instagram would be the follow-up. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin, for yeah. talking to us. And thank you, Bianca, for the incredible questions oh you God, gave Erin. Thanks for having me back. Super fun. Yeah. I love this. <laughs> and thank you to the Strand Smokehouse yeah. of Astoria, Queens. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to Strand Smokehouse for having us. And these beers are so good. Thanks, ladies. Cheers. 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 <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this interview with Erin and Bianca. Make sure to visit theoffbeatlife.com or email me at guest at theoffbeatlife.com for more information and how you can become mentored on the podcast. Hey, Offbeat family, I really appreciate you listening to this episode. I would love to hear more from you and what you think of the podcast suggestions on guests, topics we can discuss, or maybe you just want to be friends. Why don't we chat some more on Facebook at The OB Life or send me a message at hello at theoffbeatlife.com. I can't wait to hear from you.